UAB MedCast is an ongoing medical education podcast. The UAB Division of Continuing Education designates that each episode of this enduring material is worth a maximum of 0.25 AMA PRA Category 1 credit. To collect credit, please visit uabmedicine.org slash medcast and complete the episode's post-test. Welcome to UAB MedCast, a continuing education podcast for medical professionals. Bringing knowledge to your world. Here's Melanie Cole. Extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, ECMO, has remarkably progressed over the recent years and it has become an invaluable tool in the care of adults and children with severe cardiac and pulmonary dysfunction refractory to conventional management. My guest today is Dr. Nirmal Sharma. He's a specialist in pulmonary, allergy, and critical care medicine at UAB Medicine. Welcome to the show, Dr. Sharma. Tell us about the evolution of ECMO. Thank you, Melanie. So ECMO is not a technology in isolation. It stems from the cardiopulmonary bypass system that were used in the operating room in the 1950s. And uh, the first use of ECMO uh, in humans was 1971. Uh, At that point, some early trials were done to compare ECMO with other modalities of cardiopulmonary support. Those trials, unfortunately, did not show any great survival benefit with the ECMO arm. However, uh, it did show that uh, the rates of complications were highly increased in the ECMO arm as compared to the non-ECMO arm. So the use of ECMO was uh, mostly restricted to uh, critically ill pediatric and neonatal cases. Its use in adult was uh, very, very less and was mostly used as a salvage technique uh, in patients. In the 1990s, again, uh, some trials were performed on ECMO, uh, comparing it to other modalities of treatment, and uh, results were similar. There were increased complications noted again with no survival benefit. So it was not until the mid-2000s that ECMO really became mainstream. In 2007-8, the CESAR trial was published out of the United Kingdom. It showed that patients with uh, acute respiratory failure, if they were sent to centers who had ECMO experience, as compared to centers who did not, they tended to do better. There was marked survival advantage um, of sending patients with respiratory failure to ECMO centers. And uh, in 2009, during the uh, H1N1 flu pandemic, uh, ECMO was used uh, to support several young patients who were otherwise healthy uh, and who would not have uh, made it through without ECMO. And uh, it was only after that that the utilization of ECMO uh, became mainstream and it really uh, increased dramatically. In fact, uh, several publications have shown that in the last decade or so, the utilization of ECMO for all causes has increased more than 400%. I think uh, this main uh, increase in utilization is due to improved technology, uh, better training uh, of physicians and other staff members in uh, the management of patients on ECMO, and, uh, of course, better understanding of the anticoagulation practices that are needed to support the ECMO circuit. So how does it compare to conventional mechanical ventilatory support for ARDS, for example? So, you know, if you see head-to-head, unfortunately, there are no great trials available to compare ECMO or mechanical ventilation head-to-head. You go back in the 1970s, uh, in in 1979, a randomized trial by Zappol was published, and uh, it basically showed that mechanical ventilation and ECMO were equivalent in, in terms of mortality, but... Folks who were on ECMO uh, had higher uh, incidence of complications. But, you know, the fact is that uh, when we look back 40 years, uh, we really did not use ECMO the way it was supposed to be, you know, utilized. Uh, What ECMO is uh, supposed to provide is an avenue where you can reduce the intensity of mechanical ventilation or completely get rid of it. Because as you know, mechanical ventilation can 
in fact, lead to uh, ventilator-induced lung injury, if, uh, especially if you're on very high settings. So uh, later on, we had a trial uh, in 2000. This is the most recent trial in 2008, which was published. It was called the CSER trial. It tried to compare, although they did not compare mechanical ventilation to ECMO heads-on, but uh, they found that if you transfer a patient to a center with uh, expertise in ECMO, uh, those patients uh, seem to have done better than patients who were just left on mechanical ventilation at centers that did not perform ECMO. But in our experience, uh, you know, we've been able to reduce or completely uh, take off mechanical ventilation as soon as we uh, cannulate and place uh, a patient on ECMO support. So uh, that has been, you know, it, it provides uh, lung rest uh, and it reduces the incidence of ventilator-induced lung injury and thereby helping the lung to recover, uh, you know, some or complete function. As clinical indications are divided into the three categories according to the supported organ, cardiac, respiratory, or combination of the two, tell us about the indications for ECMO for cardiac support. So for cardiac support, uh, you know, it's it's called VA ECMO, uh, venoarterial ECMO. There are several indications. Uh, myocardial infarction, associated cardiogenic shock, that's a primary indication. Uh, we get uh, quite a few of those uh, where... Uh, despite our best efforts to maintain circulation through medications uh, and sometimes balloon pump, assist device like balloon pump, we're not able to provide the circulatory support. So we put these patients on uh, via ECMO and try to support them. Uh, other indications are fulminant myocarditis, uh, sometimes uh, severe sepsis-associated myocardial depression, uh, Sometimes, uh, you know, patients have cardiopulmonary arrest, uh, and it has been utilized in um, cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Post-cardiotomy uh, or post-heart transplant cardiogenic shock is also uh, a recent indication. Uh, primary graft failure, uh, after, especially after heart transplant, uh, and also sometimes the bridge to ventricular assist device implantation or heart transplantation. Uh, these are, uh, you know, some of the major reasons that we use uh, uh, ECMO for cardiac support. And what about contraindications for cardiac support? So contraindications, it's our relative. Uh, if you have uncontrolled active hemorrhage, uh, then, of course, uh, you have to choose since uh, for optimal function of the ECMO circuitry, uh, we need uh, systemic anticoagulation. So uh, I would say that if you have uncontrolled uh, active hemorrhage, uh, it, uh, we generally don't prefer to put those patients on. If the patients uh, have some kind of terminal illness, uh, which uh, you know, limits their uh, uh, life expectancy you know, more than six months or a year, uh, despite you know, all efforts, then I would say uh, we prefer not to uh, utilize ECMO on them. And if they have uh, irreversible uh, end-state heart disease and they're not a candidate for either a transplant or uh, destination therapy with uh, ventricular assist devices, then that's an absolute contraindication. And uh, sometimes, you know, there is other uh, relative contraindications like patients uh, who are advanced aged, who are uh, morbidly obese, uh, who have uh, some degree of, I would say, multi-organ failure. Uh, they are the patients uh, who are also very carefully looked into and uh, are not preferred uh, to be placed on uh, venoarterial arterial support. And what about ECMO indications and contraindications for respiratory support? For respiratory support, the primary indication uh, that we use it for is uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome, or ARDS due to any cause. So with patients who've had uh, ARDS secondary to pneumonia, uh, secondary to pancreatitis, uh, secondary to traumatic, it could be a traumatic ARDS. Uh, patients have had uh, aspiration after uh, surgery and have developed ARDS. Uh, we've also used uh, ECMO for 
the resp- uh, you know, for respiratory support in patients with end-stage lung disease who are being bridged to lung transplantation. If they have a sudden decline in their function and uh, cannot be supported for, uh, with mechanical ventilation or require very uh, intense mechanical ventilation and sedation, then we, uh, we bridge them uh, using ECMO. And also we've used uh, ECMO for primary graft failure after lung transplantation uh, or sometimes even acute rejection episodes, severe acute rejection episodes after lung transplantation. Uh, these are a few indications for uh, uh, respiratory failure. But uh, off late, there has been a new indication um, primarily for patients who've had uh, COPD or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or asthmatic exacerbations. Uh, In these patients, uh, specifically elevated carbon dioxide levels are uh, the main problem. And uh, the ECMO circuit is very, very efficient in removing the carbon dioxide, even at very, very low flow rates. So that's uh, an upcoming indication for uh, respiratory support on ECMO. And what about some of the patient selection criteria? What goes into that? So again, you know, the most important thing in our experience has been the benefit of ECMO is when the patient is able to participate in this care, can ambulate. So we, our center is very, very big on ambulation on ECMO, and we have seen that patients who can ambulate, their chances of recovery are much higher than patients who cannot. So uh, we look at uh, uh, several factors. One of them is if there is multi-organ dysfunction, then we generally prefer not to support them with ECMO because in our experience, those PA patients tend not to do well. Now, if they have, again, if they have some uh, bleeding of uh, unclear etiology, something which is uh, which can potentially uh, prevent us from using anticoagulation, uh, that becomes a relative contraindication. Uh, although we have done several ECMO runs without uh, the utilization of systemic anticoagulation, but uh, we prefer uh, that they don't have a bleeding risk. Now, uh, sometimes if they have uh, if they have malignancy or uh, if they have immunosuppression because of some other reason, uh, like poor nutrition, uh, we generally tend to uh, avoid those cases. Uh, Morbid obesity, I would say, is a relative contraindication. We've had a fair amount of success with uh, obese patients. We've had several cases uh, where we have supported these individuals. Uh, Ideally, we prefer that uh, they're not morbidly obese, uh, but uh, we make uh, case-by-case decisions on those. And also, if uh, patients have been mechanically ventilated with very high oxygen and high PEEP for uh, more than seven days, uh, then we look into several factors. We very carefully look in those cases and then decide whether they are appropriate for uh, ECMO support. And Dr. Sharma, in just the last few minutes, wrap it up for us what you want other physicians to know about the use of ECMO management strategies. What do you want to tell them? Well, I think the most important thing I want to tell them is that Uh, If you do have patients uh, with uh, cardiac or respiratory failure that uh, you're not able to support with conventional methodologies, with conventional strategies, then we suggest that you contact us earlier. Uh, We contact us sooner than later. Uh, We've seen that patients uh, who arrive to our center within the first three or four days of uh, mechanical ventilation or other forms of cardiac support they tend to do a little bit better than those patients who come late uh, uh, in the in the phase of the disease. Uh, that's one. So we are uh, available. We're just a phone call away. And the number they can call is uh, 1-800-UAB-MIST. And you can ask for the advanced lung disease physician on call. There are four of us, and uh, we'll be happy to take your call and get the patient transferred to our center as soon as possible. 
And tell us about your team. Why is UAB so great to work with? So, uh, Melanie, I think there are several factors to it. Uh, I think UAB as such is great in terms of medical care. Uh, As far as ECMO is concerned, I think uh, our uh, audience should know that UAB is one of the few centers in the country with uh, a very large ECMO volume, and that has given us a lot of experience in management of patients on ECMO. Uh, We are able to do uh, several cases uh, on ECMO which uh, are traditionally uh, not done in other centers. Also, uh, the great thing about UAB is that we have a very, very uh, cohesive, multidisciplinary team of experts ranging from medical physicians, surgeons, physical therapists, respiratory therapists, and specialized ECMO nurses uh, who can provide holistic care to the patient. Additionally, we're one of the few programs in the country that uh, provide uh, ambulatory ECMO. That means we're able to provide uh, physical therapy to some select group of patients on ECMO support or waiting for uh, recovery of their lungs or heart or, you know, uh, if they're being bridged to organ transplantation. And uh, we have also the ability to uh, cannulate patients uh, at uh, other sites. That means if we have a referral from uh, another hospital uh, in or around Alabama, uh, we have uh, the uh, the infrastructure to fly in there, cannulate the patients, and bring them back uh, through our critical care transport system on ECMO support. So I think these factors make us very we place us in a very very unique spot uh, nationally and especially in the southeast region. Thank you so much for being with us today. You're listening to UAB MedCast. For more information on resources available at UAB Medicine, you can go to uabmedicine.org slash physician. That's uabmedicine.org slash physician. This is Melanie Cole. Thanks so much for listening.